The tradition of humanistic education and the enduring commitment to the promotion of justice and reconciliation make Jesuit colleges and universities particularly important resources in this year marked by student protests and a divisive election cycle. I'm Jim McCartan, chair of the National Seminar on Jesuit Higher Education, which publishes conversations on Jesuit higher education. I'm pleased to share with you this conversation, led by members of the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities Commission on Democracy and Citizenship. Members of the commission are joined by Ibu Patel of Interfaith America to explore the distinctive role of Jesuit institutions today. Hi, I'm Daniel Klinghard from the College of the Holy Cross. Uh, I, along with my colleague Amber Wachowski of Marquette University, are co-chairs of the AJCU's Commission on Democracy and Citizenship. And over the past year, our commission has been working on a set of recommendations uh, for the way that colleges and universities support democracy and encourage the development of informed citizenship. We're not focused on a traditional notion of civics education, although that's certainly part of what we aim to do, but on the ways we prepare our students more broadly for engaged citizenship in democratic society. A big part of that preparation involves accustoming students to engage with one another across a range of differences. And that's why we're excited about this conversation with Ibu Patel. Uh, Ibu is founder and president of Interfaith America, the le nation's leading interfaith organization with the mission to inspire, equip, and connect leaders and institutions to unlock the potential of America's religious diversity. He served on President Obama's inaugural Faith Council and is an Ahsoka Fellow and the author of five books, including We Need to Build Field Notes for Diverse Democracy. Most relevant for our purposes, he'll also be a keynote speaker at the AJCU's Justice Conference, July 16th through 19th, 2024, at the Loyola University of Chicago, which is when we will also be presenting our recommendations for thinking about Jesuit colleges and universities as agents of democratic citizenship formation. Father Michael Garanzini, AJCU president, thought this opened the possibility of a conversation around the commonalities of our work, which is what brings us together today. So with that, let me introduce to you the members of our commission who are joining us today. Uh, first from University of Scranton, uh, Julie Schumacher-Cohen. Uh, I mentioned Amber Wachowski from Marquette University uh, and Eric Owens from Boston College. Uh, and of course, uh, Ibu Patel here. So um, let me uh, get started by talking specifically about how you're thinking about the conference. So let me just ask what energizes you about speaking to the AJCU conference this summer? Uh, how are you how are you planning? How are you thinking about uh, how that address is gonna gonna come forward? And how do you think about engaging with uh, Jesuit universities with the work that you're doing? First of all, thank you for having me. And I'm, I'm excited to be in this conversation with you all. I'm excited to speak at the conference in July. And, and I'm excited to work with Jesuit universities on something that I think you all already do very well and, and have been leaders in the nation and actually the civilization. And, and, and that's what I want to say at, at the outset. So much of what I have learned about the philosophy of a diverse democracy has been from Catholic, uh, particularly Jesuit theologians. So let's begin with, with maybe the most prominent Jesuit writer on this. That's John Courtney Murray. He says that civilization is living and talking together. That is his definition of civilization, right? And if that's the case, it means the cathedral of a civilization is a residential university. That is the place where we live and talk together. And John Courtney Murray said that a university is special because there are creeds at war intelligibly. Creeds at war intelligibly. In other words, you should expect people to have distinct identities and divergent ideologies and to engage each other in a respectful way focused on learning and cooperation. That is what a university does. That is why it is a cathedral of civilization. Right. This is your philosopher talking, by the way. Right. Uh, I've just like absorbed it whole. He also said that what we call the person who destroys the conversation, we call that person a barbarian. Civilization is living and talking together. Bar barbarism is destroying the conversation. Mm. Right. And so, any way that we can kind of facilitate 
the positive exchange of divergent ideologies from diverse people in a respectful, civil way, focused on cooperation and learning, we are engaged in civilization. We're engaged in a form of holiness. My dad went to Notre Dame University. Uh, I'm, I think that's a sacred place, and, and I'm well aware of Father Hesper calling it a crossroads in a lighthouse. It is a place where people of different backgrounds meet in a in a manner characterized by friendship, and and it was not ashamed to be lit by the wisdom of the Catholic tradition. And my father, an Ismaili Muslim, felt as if he flourished at that crossroads in a lighthouse. So again, another Catholic theologian, philosopher, Father Hesper, who lead who who led uh, uh, an uh, an institution of higher education philosophizing about what made that special. And the final person I would say was, is also a Notre Dame, Alistair McIntyre, who says that the job of a university is to initiate you into constrained conflict. The job of a university is to initiate its students into a constrained conflict and to train them how to rationally order their arguments around that conflict. That is what we do, right? So I am excited to to uh, bring what I have learned from the Catholic tradition about what it means to live in a diverse democracy, the role that universities play, the centrality of dialogue across difference to a group of people who I think are actually doing it quite well and uh, who play a very important role in a deeply divided nation. That's fantastic. I mean, it leads really well to, I think, our next question. So you've noted that our institutions are these cathedrals of, of civilization. And when we're thinking about our, our present moment, um, you know, vast, deep polarization, multiple wars that are stressing our, our communities, um, the ways in which we engage with one another, these are these can be very difficult moments. And so thinking about the obligations that colleges and universities have to do this job, to make dialogue across difference, a part of the educational experience for young people, how would you define or describe those obligations? What should we be doing to make that a reality? I think one of the things that's special about an American college or university is, is that we are not here in a war zone. And I think that that's actually really important, right? We try to create contexts in which diaspora groups whose sister communities might be in conflict elsewhere, can be in dialogue here. I think that's actually really, really important, right? And why is it important? Because for ever, human beings have believed that identity conflicts were inevitable, that if group A and B are fighting in one part of the world, they will inevitably fight in another part of the world. And I actually think that universities give civilization a great gift when they say, actually, we recognize that there is a significant war in Yemen, in Sudan, in uh, the Gaza Strip in Israel, in Ethiopia. And we are proud to say that the people, that, that the diaspora groups who are here study together in our laboratories, play together on our intramural teams, room together in our residence halls. And of course there's tension, but there isn't violence. Right? We are a distinctive context in which identity groups are able to, to engage with one another in a spirit of, as, as McIntyre says, constrained conflict. You are able to have the dialogue here and you hope that it has an ameliorate, ameliorating effect over there. So I can build on that a little bit. Um, one of the questions that we've been wrestling with a, lo a lot is how we place dialogue in the context of other types of political engagement. So sort of that continuum from deliberation to participation in democracy. And sometimes, you know, you're, you, we've hit on it a little bit, sometimes the differences can be so broad, the conflict does come in a bit and make things raw. Um, and students, obviously, there's lots of forms of more confrontational political action that we're seeing in terms of protest and advocacy. So how do you see models of dialogue intersecting with and maybe informing more confrontational politics? So 
I I imagine that nobody at your universities says to an incoming first year student, hey, listen, you really want to come to to the College of the Holocaust or Marquette and you want to pay us $80,000 a year to meet people with viewpoints you disagree with and scream at them. I'm pausing with actual seriousness, right? Like nobody says that, right? Like pay us $80,000 a year, which is what you charge to scream at people that you disagree with. So what do you promise here? If that is not what you're promising your students, what are you promising them? I think what you're promising them is you pay us $80,000 a year to gather a diverse and interesting community of students and scholars and administrators and curate it into a rich learning environment where if you pay attention and lean in, you will learn things that you never thought you could learn. You'll cooperate with people you never thought you'd cooperate with. Every once in a while, you might yell at somebody, we'll protect your free speech right to do that as long as you don't spit in their face or, or, or shake your fist in a threatening way. Once in a while, that happens, we understand. But principally, we're a learning environment. And you pay us to be a learning environment. And if what you really want to do is scream at people that you disagree with, you should go to the town square and do that for free. And I I don't disagree with that. Like, I think it's a perfectly legit thing to do. I just don't know why you'd pay Boston College $80,000 a year to spend your time doing that. Let me maybe ask a question that steps backward for the conditions for the possibility of a true democratic culture. Because um, in the midst of cynical politics that suggests that power is everything, that gathering a, a, a tight minority can dominate politics or that, um, uh, that, that the procedures are everything, you know, what your life's work has been and our commission's interests are is to develop a democratic culture of respect across difference. And for me, I think one of the things that's been challenging over the past few decades has been the loss of trust in institutions and the loss of social trust among among people amidst cynical politics, sometimes identity politics, um, a variety of things. So I wonder if you might reflect a little bit on what uh, what avenues for rebuilding or shoring up social trust uh, you have in mind such that our students in the generations to come can function in the as a part of a democratic culture uh, with the virtues and habits uh, and uh, relationships to one another that's required for a truly open democratic society. Well, you know, it's the month of Ramadan where Muslims increase in piety, including many times fasting and and uh, uh, focus on the texts of their faith and the values of their faith, et cetera. Um, uh, and so uh, part of what I do is I just go back to, and I, I read, I read, Islamic theology and Muslim texts. And one of the things I read recently was, was a Muslim scholar saying, Islam can really, it really comes down to one word and the word is gratitude. That's what Islam is, it's gratitude, right? And what's gratitude? Gratitude is being thankful for what other people have done. That's what it is, right? And in the first place, it's what God has done, making creation and putting us in a particular place in creation, but it's really what other people have done also, right? So. I want to put that religious value alongside a, a recent story that that I experienced. So when, when I published my book, We Need to Build, uh, a couple of years ago, doing the round of interviews, and I, I get interviewed by this 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 journalist, twenty something year old journalist, and he says to me in the course of the interview, kind of self righteously, he's like, you know, what do you have to say to my generation who is skeptical of institutions and and all institutionalized forms and the oppression that institutions do? I'm like, uh huh. Where'd you learn how to swim, man? Where'd you learn how to swim? Somebody throw you into a lake and say, make it back to shore? Or did you go to a YMCA or a park district or a Jewish community center where some instructor painstakingly affixed floaties to every inch of your body when you were four years old and helped you doggy paddle, and then helped you do a front crawl, and then encouraged you to do the backstroke, and then told you that it was okay to put your nose in the water for the breaststroke, and 
that instructor was hired by an aquatics director who uh, makes sure that there's an instructor for every class and every individual lesson. And that aquatics director was hired by an executive director. And that executive director is actually the 12th in line of executive directors of an institution that was built 70 years ago. Right? And by the way, choose anything. Algebra, reading To Kill a Mockingbird, playing football. Somebody built the thing where you learn how to do that. What, why wouldn't you be grateful for that? Right? So I just think like, and, and, and again, I think, it, I think of it as, as a civic value to be grateful for the, for the things that other people have done for you right? Your teachers and your coaches. Um, but I think it, it's a spiritual value also. And that means to not be grateful is a spiritual violation, right? The opposite of gratefulness, the opposite of the positive value of gratefulness is it's, it's a violation of that value. I, I think that's a problem, right? Um, I would like things to be better. I think we should encourage things to be better, I think it is a good idea to not start with everything that's wrong, but to start with, with how things have gone right and ask how they could go right even more. That is my preferred approach to the, the, the contributions of the past, including the people of the past, and, and the possibility for constructive social change in the future. Can I follow up, Daniel? Uh with a quick, um, you can edit this out if needed, but uh, uh, I'm I'm curious, you know, in in all of the work you've done around building relationships across religious differences and cultural differences, it seems to me that one of your primary commitments is in doing things together, not just talking uh, across, talking to one another like knee to knee. Um, and I guess part of me thinks that maybe the the ways that we build trust in our institutions or trust in one another is doing things together. Um, and I wonder if you wanted to reflect on what that what the doing might be. Um, it, it needn't always be service in the community. It could be other things as well. But I, I guess I wonder if you might expand on that a little bit about the the, the, the solution across difference in addition to the to the starting um, disposition of gratitude that I certainly appreciate. So, so uh, let me begin by saying that I think what John Courtney Murray means when he says uh, a civilization is living and talking together is 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 in talking he he's including jazz and baseball right like in other words he's including things that we might categorize as doing these are different ways of engaging with one another right like there's there's different forms of dialogue there's a that great scene in Zorba the Greek where he's talking about. Uh, uh, his Russian friend and and uh, uh, you know the person he's talking to says, well, you know what happens when your broken Russian is not good enough to explain what you want to explain, and and his broken Greek is not good enough. And Zorba the Greek says, well, then we just dance out our our language, right? And there, there's different. There's so in other words, I think that there are different languages in in dialogue. That's how I understand the term dialogue. Having said that, um, uh, it's important to be specific about these different languages. And and I think that actually the great genius of American civil society is the spaces where we come together to engage in what I call concrete activities for common aims that guide cooperative relationships. Little League is the best example of this, right? So, you know, the, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, the guys who coached my younger son's Little League team, Palestinian guy and a Jewish guy who's a strong supporter of Israel, and they probably disagree in the Middle East, you know? But when they co-coach the team, they they focus their attention on what's the signal to steal from uh, uh, from first to second base, and what's the signal to steal from second base to third base, right? And and are are we going to teach our our kids to bunt, or are we going to teach them just to hit for the fences? And and that's the genius of American society, is you have an institution like Little League Baseball, like a YMCA, like Habitat for Humanity like Catholic Charities and Amer Interfaith America has a major initiative with these organizations called Team Up that, that basically says we need to involve more people from diverse identities and divergent ideologies in the civic institutions that, that focus on concrete activities with common aims that guide cooperative relationships. So I think of it as a form of dialogue, but I understand that most people use dialogue as, as you know, the actual physical act of talking together. So I'm happy to say that like, 
you play baseball together and you talk together and both of those are good things. But I really, I like, I really think to myself, like, like, what if we didn't have that? What if we did not have those institutions that brought people who really disagree with each other together in powerful ways, you know, and for the people who say, you, you know, but everything is political, everything is political. I'm like, yeah, really? If there's a fire in your house, you want the fire department to call, uh, you, you want to call the fire department and then say, hey, yeah, what's your address? By the way, who'd you vote for? Everything is political, right? You, I really hope you didn't vote for people who who are uh, uh, who are who are accelerating the knowledge economy because it's taking my uncle's job away. Not everything is political. There's a lot of things that are civic. Baseball is civic. It's not political, right? Fire departments are civic. They're not political. I'm I'm happy to pick the thread up here. Um, so, Ibu, you mentioned, and I like this point about that there are different languages of dialogue, but there is a commonality in terms of perhaps maybe norms of civility. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about, about civility. I mean, it's there are some who critique it, you know, the ways at which it gets enforced or put upon um, discussion, deliberation, dialogue, that it perhaps has a chilling effect um, does it chill speech? Um, does it have a disproportionate impact on some voices, some communities? So I'm I'm wondering how you approach this this question of of civility and the critiques of civility. Yeah. Um, so I I think civility is a holy value. In 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 Islamic Arabic, the term for it is 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 adab, uh, which basically means proper decorum. It's how you are meant to treat other people. So, so I think it's not just a democratic value. Uh, in you know, it's back to John Courtney Murray living and talking together, right? Every once in a while, you might yell. I get it. Important, but you can't always be yelling, right? And you can't always be imposing your view. Like you should listen also. And so, civility is a is a way that we in, we honor our own voices and other people's voices also. And I, I think it's I think it's of central importance to institutions that are animated by a religious spark. I think it's I think it's essential for democracy but ascent, but but important for institutions that that uh, um have a religious spark. It's, it's a religious value. It's a religious value. Um you know in in the in the written question that you sent me, it had the term minoritized voices. You didn't ask that in your question, maybe because you correctly assumed that it would offend me, you know? Um, but I, people, this notion of like, um, you know, minoritized voices shouldn't be expected to engage civilly. All right, let's talk. Am I a minoritized voice? Do you, do you self-declare yourself a minoritized voice? If you don't expect me to engage in the reasonable norms of a classroom, what else am I not expected to do? Can I not play quarterback? Can I not do calculus? Have you set an authenticity standard that authentic minority voices scream at other people? That's what the right kind of minority does. I mean, if you think you can't engage civilly in a conversation, you should tap out. It's okay. Tap out. Right? For the other 30 students here, this is how we learn from each other. So, so maybe on that topic of sort of tapping out, I think we you brought up that idea of constrained conflict and also cooperation, but I guess to bring us back to the conflict piece, there are critiques of times where you bring conflictual groups like Israelis and Palestinians, and I have some experience with that together, but they aren't talking about the hard issues or they aren't talking about sort of the structural injustices or the things that do bring them apart. One of the quotes that we've been reflecting a lot on that um, is in Pope Francis's encyclical uh, Fratelli Tutti, and I'll, and I'll read from it, he, he, he said, Authentic reconciliation does not flee from conflict, but is achieved in conflict. 
resolving it through dialogue and open, honest, and patient negotiation. So I guess maybe, you know, how do we really make sure that in these dialogues, not we don't want we don't want people to be screaming at each other ideally, but they really need to be comfortable that the very mo the most tense, the most sort of substantive disagreements that they have are going to be in the room and that they're not going to be glossed over because sometimes people withdraw from dialogue or even cooperative activities if they feel like that's not going to be addressed. Uh, so, I mean, this is one of the things I admire about the Catholic tradition is that, is that it values a variety of things in tension. So it, it values civility, again, as, as a sacred value, living and talking together, and it values a particular view of justice. And it doesn't exclude the consideration of other views of justice. So justice is not just one thing. We all know that. People rarely say it, but a Reformed Jew and uh, uh, an Orthodox, it, it, uh, um, uh, kind of a Vatican following Catholic are going to have different views of justice on really important questions. And we all know what those are, right? So I value how the Catholic tradition is a crossroads in a lighthouse. It brings people together. And Father Hesper would always emphasize, we bring people together in a, in a, in a, in, in a fellowship, in, in, a, in, in, a, in a manner of positive meeting. And then we have a wisdom that we, that we are unabashed about sharing, Right. And by the way, we know everybody, we're a lamppost, but everybody brings a lantern. Like we know that there are other wisdoms also. So I value that about, about the Catholic tradition. Look, I, I think that there are there are moments in history where we talk, where we emphasize civility and civic fellowship too much and do not talk enough about matters of structural injustice. We are not in one of those moments. Right. Like like right now, th let me ask you this. Walk around, walk around the academic buildings on your campus and tell me how many faculty members have a poster with a raised fist and how many faculty members have a poster with an outstretched hand. Not a raised fist moment. Right. But I'll tell you something. Mandela in prison, 27 years at Robben Island, he learned the names of his jailer's kids. He learned how to speak their language, Afrikaans, right? He led with the outstretched hand. So I, I would rather us emphasize the, the cooperative work we can do together to lift everybody up that rather than rather than the work of tearing things down, because I have to tell you something, I have not met that many people who could tear things who who want to tear things down, who could build them back better. And I would just challenge your students straight up. Go ahead, defund the police. What if I put you in charge of public safety tomorrow? What if you were responsible? I, I really appreciated that part um, of of your of your book where you you, you conveyed that sentiment that uh, and I, I think it's a it's it's the kind of idea that I try to offer my students who are cynical is it's easy to tear things down uh, but but how do you create a positive vision right that that replaces what you're tearing down but I'll I'll confess that the 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 minoritized uh, groups uh, phrasing was mine I think Amber uh, phrased the question a lot better but I'll tell you kind of where where that was coming from um, in 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 my own thinking and that is. Um, Colleagues, as as we've tried to to bring in the concept of development here, I'm just sorry, uh, dialogue on campus uh, here, um, have have sometimes responded in saying, well, you know, for for some kids, um, engaging in dialogue is very low stakes, and for other kids, that 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 at the same institution, that same discussion can be very high stakes. So if you have a a, a white kid and a, and a black kid, and the subject is affirmative action. Um, the stakes for one are different for the stakes or another. Maybe they feel different. In, in a similar way, if you know, if you've got a, a Catholic student from from Worcester um, talking with a, a Palestinian student uh, who's got family in in Gaza, the stakes might feel a little bit different uh, for those in those two different situations. Um, and so, I think part of that that concern is. Um, 
when you're asking me to dialogue, you're asking me to to put aside a little bit of the the emotion and the personal uh, connection I have to that in the interest of maintaining a, a a dialogue. So, how would you respond to folks who who yeah. have that criticism? So, so by the way, Daniel, I, I don't blame you for this at all, right? Right. I, I think I th it is a common construction, but I want to be clear about how I feel about it, which is, I. I feel as if somebody is telling me I can't do something because of my identity. And I, literally, I want to, what else do you not expect me to be able to do? I'm not asking you personally, right? Well, honestly, like what, what else do you not expect? Like if, if I can't, if you think because of my identity, I should not be expected to carry on a conversation about a complicated issue what, why does the football coach think that that I can run the offense against a bunch of 300 pound defensive linemen? Right? Why does my my science professor think that I can be a heart surgeon? Everybody else seems to expect the same of me, but you think I can't even read a book or enter a conversation? That kind of seems infantilizing. And and part of what I want to say is the onus is on the person who thinks that quote unquote minoritized identity creates a different expectation set. If you believe that, you have to prove it. I don't, I, I don't have to prove, my default assumption is everybody enters a situation able to excel. Now, some people might need some more support than others. Like I'm a believer in bridge programs, et cetera, right? But I, everybody enters a situation able to excel unless you tell me you can't personally. And then I'm happy to hear it, right? But I am not going to make any assumption with respect to your race, gender, sexuality, geography, class, whatever, about what you cannot do. And I would like to say to anybody who wants to make that assumption of me or my kids, what do you assume I can't do? Tell me to my face because of my identity. How do you, how do you think, what's your thought about how we've got to this place where people are skeptical of dialogue as a as a way of, of moving past our current uh, sort of polarized uh, environment and and maybe that's part of it maybe it's it, people are so polarized that they feel like they that there's no reason to, to talk but how, how do you explain how we've or how, how might you explain how we've yeah. how we've so I, 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 I'll, I'll state this in kind of academic terms right so um I think what was 15 years ago, an interesting critique, right? What anti-racism is an interesting critique. Critical race theory is an interesting critique. I think an interesting critique morphed into a paradigm. What's a paradigm? A paradigm is, a critique is when somebody says, you've left this out of your explanation. A paradigm is a framework that pretends to explain the world. So this is how non-white people and women and gay people engage with the world. It's, a, it's an overall explanation. A critique morphed into a paradigm, which then morphed into a regime. What's a regime? A regime is a paradigm that has coercive and punitive powers. A bias response team at a campus is an excellent example of a regime. We expect incidents of bias to happen with such frequency and intensity that we are going to set up an investigative procedure, a formalized procedure. We're going to advertise it with posters all across the campus. And there is going to be coercive and punitive powers associated with it. We can punish you. Right? So I appreciate this way of thinking when it is a critique. I think it is an interesting question. So for example, the question might be, I'm curious how people of different identities might enter a situation where there are different stakes for different people, right? 
That's an interesting question, right? And I might say to that, well, you know what? I was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. I read a lot of books over three and a half years on Cecil Rhodes's money. I probably enter situations pretty darn well prepared. I should pay attention to that privilege. And somebody else would be like, but I was thinking about your brown skin. And I'd be like, and what were you thinking about it? Great. I, I think we have time. Eric, you unmuted. You have a question? Okay. Well, just time for a couple more questions. Just briefly, sure. Um, if we could zoom out and scope a little bit. Um, one of our concerns uh, when thinking about civic education is global civic education or global citizenship education or some whatever the terminology we'd like to use. Um, um, could you maybe reflect a little bit on the relationship between the global and the yeah. local? Um, and this is this is actually one of come the into this a few different ways already in our conversation, but it you know yeah. if you have a particular perspective on it, I think it'd be great to hear. I mean, this is one this is one of the things that I think makes the the conversation about privileged and marginalized in residential U.S. higher education. So I don't know. I don't. I was distorted. Imagine this. I mean, this is this is a totally plausible scenario. Okay, somebody is in a critical theory class at Boston College, and reads a bunch of Foucault and Said and Spivak, and starts to call themselves the subaltern and Fanon, right? And starts to refer to themselves as 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 the marginalized and the oppressed. Totally common for a nineteen year old. I did it. Okay, and that person does a study abroad in India. And they get off the plane in Bombay Airport, in Mumbai Airport, and they look at the thousand leprous children who are begging outside the airport. And they think to themselves, you and me, we're really the same. You're oppressed and I'm oppressed. You're the subaltern and I'm the subaltern. Have you done your job at Boston College if that's what happens? I mean, that's ridiculous. But you know what? Whether you're whether you're in Chestnut Hill or in South Calaba and Bombay, those kids exist. And isn't the job of Boston College to teach a bunch of privileged 19-year-olds that there's like actual soul-crushing, grinding physical poverty in the world? And our job is to like do something to help folks. That if you're in four-year US residential higher education, especially if you're at a Jesuit institution, you're amongst the most privileged people in human history. Alhamdulillah, praise be to God. That's not a scold. That's an elevation. Let, let's go make the world better. Who's in a better position than us? And honestly, that's not a theory. Let's, let's get out of world map. Put your finger any place on the map. I promise you, your life is better. What, like, why wouldn't we focus on that, right? So are you suggesting that that's the proper mode of global education is to remind people of our privilege vis-a-vis -vis other people in the world? Or are there other dynamics that you want to lift up? I think that the two dynamics that I want to lift up is the, is, forgive me for that, let me see if this is my wife. Uh, um, uh, number one, the material privilege that anybody in U.S. residential higher education has, full stop, okay? There's 8 billion people in the world. 4 billion people live on less than $7, $7 a day. 1.5 billion people live with parasitic worms. I promise you, if you're in U.S. residential higher education, you're one of the most privileged people in human history. And... If I was the president of a university, that would be the, my first sentence in, in my first year convocation address. And again, it wouldn't be a scold. I'm not scolding you. I'm not scolding you, right? I am inviting you into a state of elevation where you can consider the question of service. How, how can you learn enough here to be of service? Okay, so that's that's one. That's just a fact. Right, like there's two kinds of people in the world: people who don't have enough to eat and people who throw food away. Go to the cafeteria in any residence hall on your campus. 
and ask the question, what kind, of, what kind of people are we? So I think that's one question as it relates to the global context. I think the second question is, we are generally not in hot conflict in the United States of America. There's problems here, right? But this isn't Gaza. It's not Yemen. It's not Sudan. It's not Ethiopia. It's not even most our Bosnia-Herzegovina, where there are separate Catholic and Muslim fire departments for Catholic and Muslim neighborhoods. The Muslim fire department does not respond to a fire on the Catholic side of town. We are a cathedral of living and talking together. We are the zenith of civilization. Let's lean in. Let's learn as much as we can. Let's cooperate as much as possible. Let's let us let's soak all of this in and then go out and be as as we Muslims say, Ramatul Alameen, a special mercy upon all the worlds. Right. My, Brian Stevenson, who I think is the most important social social change a, 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 a leader in America right now, when he was at Eastern University, he would walk around saying, I'm a college student. I'm a college student. I'm a college student. I, I just think that's amazing, right? And and what part and Brian Stevenson is a social justice advocate, meaning he's like perfectly aware of the oppressed and the oppressor. Right. And he's like, let me tell you who the oppressed are. They are children in jail. Those are the oppressed. So let's go help them. So this kind of, the, uh, oh, oh. Go, go ahead, Julie. Yeah. So, um, you know, I do some I do work and many of us do in higher ed and community based learning. And I and I take your point a lot on the fact that and we remind our students, if you are a college student sitting in a chair there, you have you have privilege and you, you're an ambassador for the Jesuit institution that you're going out into whatever your local community is. But I think that one of the, the concerns still is that you still have there's still a lot of variety in that. And that does reflect the the structural inequalities in the United States, including you have the student who's going to do community service and then still have the extra job on the, in the evenings and the weekends. And then you have the student who's got, you know, lots of funds coming in from their parents and can go and watch TV after they finish their community service. So there's, and that, and those inequalities then can come into the dialogue space because yes, we're not in Gaza, but as we mentioned, you could be somebody with, you know, Israeli family and you could be somebody with family in Gaza. And that those, I think that's what's happening is that those things are coming into to our to our US context. And that's why we're having so much trouble. I don't think it's, I don't know that it's quite enough to say that those are overseas. I think they're here. And I think that's one of the, the one of the one of the concerns we've also talked about is 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 how to address the power differentials that still come out in these dialogues because they are what challenge them. And they're why they're why some students don't want to don't want to engage in the dialogue to begin with. So putting in some agreements and rules and things, even as simple as having timed you know, timed rounds, and that's a very Jesuit practice. Those are some of the things we do to try to counteract that. And hopefully that can work. And sometimes, but sometimes it doesn't in the sense that people are just not even coming. They don't feel like they want to enter the dialogue. I mean, Julie, I hear what you're saying, but I'm going to challenge you. So I'm an Ismaili Muslim. I'm one of a, a, a group of 15 million. I'm a minority of a minority. So what, how would you make things fairer for me? What ec what extra stool do I need to be equal to the next person in the dialogue? Well, I think first of all, you have to have agency. You have to want to be in the dialogue, and and it sounds like you are willing to be in the dialogue, but not everybody is. And the, and some people have to feel like, am I going to know that another person of my identity is there, and I, am I going to feel somewhat that I'm not the only one? I mean, these are just some of the questions that come up. I'm I don't, never. I'm enough. telling you something. I'm never. I'm going to push you. Is it okay? Yeah. I'm never in a room with another Ismaili Muslim. Ever. 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 So should I not enter? Should I be scared? Should the professor tell me that, hey, I now lack agency because I don't see somebody of my faith and likeness in that room? I think ideally, you know, we can, we, you know, the theory behind it is that with with contact theory, we've created a situation of equal status and everyone feels able to enter into that conversation. I just think that's the ideal. That's not always, either the structure isn't always being put in place or people still feel. And also we're dealing with, with students who have lived in COVID and they feel shy and they feel intimidated about person to person. I mean, I just had a dialogue on our campus a couple of weeks ago about the presidential elections and 
students were very hesitant, way more than we've, we've been doing them since 2017, way more hesitant than they were even then. So there's just a lot of, of things to overcome. So I was bringing some of that with, with the concerns that I've had expressed to me. And again, and in work I've done in Israel, Palestine, where people will say, if we're not dealing with these structural injustices, we're not even gonna get into the dialogue. We're not even gonna go into that room. But I mean, I, I, I respect that you're willing to do that. I just don't know that that's always where everyone, you know, is coming from. And and I, I think part of the part of the discussion, and I and I take this back and forth with with respect, right? With with the spirit of Adab, although we're pushing each other. And I'm kind of struck. I've got I've got two boys, 13 and 16 years old, right? And I'm kind of struck, like in school, the general attitude is we know that teaching to kill a mockingbird will make some of you unsafe. So we want to create a space where you can come to this text and feel all the feelings. And then after school and basketball practice, the coach is like, hey, Bell School runs a press that's pretty hard. They turned the last team over 12 times. We're going to run a press break. By the way, we're not turning the ball over. By the way, if we do, we're running laps of practice. You know what my kid likes more? Basketball practice. And I, I simply want to say it is it is really, I think, of basketball practice as an instructional environment. And I'm just struck that the coach in basketball practice is like, hey, we play here. We play here all the time. Nothing scares us. Six foot four centers, you know, on opposing teams don't scare us. Lightning quick point guards don't scare us. Presses don't scare us. And I'm just, I'm just struck that like in one instructional environment, there is an assumption of your identity your identity uh, subordinates you and, and makes you scared. In another instructional environment, the coach is like, we go get them. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that that any of these kind of education, dialogue, all of it put, requires us to all be vulnerable. And that's a human experience and we shouldn't shy away from that. So, um, you know, I think that would be a missed opportunity. And when students aren't willing to do that, either it's because, you know, they're that 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 unwillingness to be vulnerable will not will not get us very far. So I, I think that is an important piece of all of this. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna pull in Amber for a last question for us, but this is uh, I, I like the the dialogue. So let's uh, let's appreciate let's, it. Also, we're we're coming. Appreciate it as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Amber. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. So I'm gonna um so I'm gonna flip it a little bit um and perhaps on a on a different note or a different tone. I think when we talk about dialogue, even some of the ways in which we frame our events, how to have hard conversations, difficult conversations, we give a sense that this is something that we maybe don't want to do, but maybe it's still good for us. It's like our broccoli. But yet when we've been doing our civic dialogues programs, it doesn't always go perfectly, but more times than not, we're finding that our students are having fun. There's, there's some joy to be had to know that you can come together across lines of difference, talk about important issues, issues that matter to you. And I'm wondering, you know, if in your work, you also observe those, those moments or those opportunities and whether you think maybe in terms of us as educators, we need to also be talking about these issues, framing them a little bit differently, um, that it isn't always hard that it can be fun, that you can find a lot of purpose and meaning. Um, so I'll, I'll just throw that last question yeah. to you. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm going to say this very bluntly. I have been shaped by the Catholic intellectual tradition on this. A university is a place where you're initiated in the conflict, where you learn how to order your arguments around conflict in a rational way, and it excels at it at such a level, this is again McIntyre, that the rest of the society looks at a university to for as a model of how to rationally order their arguments around conflict. Right. So that's like I, I just think to myself like that that's what that is what we do. And I kind of think, you know, if 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 you if you go to a university, you should expect that. And if you don't get it, you're not getting what you paid for. It's just that simple, right? And I think an interesting, you know, there's two questions. When, when we consult with universities, there's two questions that we lead with. Number one, what are you promising your students? 
And no university says, pay us $80,000 a year to meet people from different backgrounds and yell at them. Or pay us $80,000 a year to meet people from different backgrounds and to be protected from their viewpoints. Try it. Try saying that to prospective students. Right? Doesn't It doesn't come off the tongue right. And the second question is, what do you promise the public? I think that is a really important question. So if I'm United Airlines and I hire a graduate of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical School, I expect that person to be able to fly a plane. If I'm inter I run Interfaith America, we are the largest interfaith organization in the country. If I hire somebody out of the civic dialogue program at Marquette University, what can I expect? What is that person good at? What's the equivalent of being able to fly a plane? Because flying a plane is a real thing. Like it's a real set of skills, right? Uh, and one of the things that kind of that kind of that always struck has struck me about pilots, you know, I'm on I'm on two flights a week, I, you, you, and I've done that for 25 years. I have never in all of my time on an airplane ever heard a pilot sound unnerved, let alone scared. The pilot always sounds calm. The pilot always sounds like she's got it. And I, I kind of think college graduates should be like that. I kind of think like what you promise students is you will enter an environment in which you will meet people of different identities. You will develop arguments. You will sharpen your arguments against other smart people. You will learn how to cooperate. You will learn intensely and you will leave as somebody who is confident and competent. That, that is what you will get if you spend four years here. That is what, that is what, and it's not always going to be easy. And to go back to a basketball coaching analogy, you know, coaches tell, tell my kids, the first six weeks is going to be hard. And you are not going to understand everything that we do. If you lean in for six weeks, we will be a good team after six weeks. And I kind of think that like, that's a very Jesuit thing. We have a way of doing things. Right. And, and I, I, I really want to emphasize this, right? You have a way of doing things that has worked for 500 years. You are, I think you should think twice about importing the paradigms of the contemporary era into a tradition that has lasted for 500 years and has figured out how to do things pretty well. Right. Traditions of, of discernment of discipline, of formation. And you guys have a tradition. And I think that you should take pride in that. And I think you should ask yourself the question, what do the institutions that embody our tradition need from us today? And how do we prepare students within our institutions for the needs of the public? And I think the Jesuit institutions are perfectly positioned to do that. I think that's a great uh, point on which to, to end this uh, this great conversation. So thank you very much, Yibu. I appreciate your time. Uh, we look forward to, to hearing more at the uh, at the Justice Conference in July. Uh, thanks, Julie, Eric, and Amber. Uh, and I'll see you at the Justice Conference in, in July as well. So great. Thanks for listening. For more resources on Jesuit higher education today, visit conversationsmagazine.org.